Let me know when it ends uh, tomorrow. apologizing to our viewers on Ustream and the, inter uh, the internet because we are having technical difficulties but we will upload the program later on tonight or tomorrow to uh, Ustream and to YouTube. Well ladies and gentlemen tonight we are going to talk about several things but they all lead to the same thing. We're going to talk about Syria. We're going to talk about the Middle East. But the last time we talked about Syria, now as most of you know, we only come to you once a month because there's really not much to talk about. We've been talking about this for the last 11 years before it even started. We've been talking about the war in Iraq before it even started and everything we have talked about in the last 11 years or 12 years, it has very much been right on the spot. But let's talk about Syria. Syria did something, well not Syria, but uh, the uh, if you remember, last program we were looking at the United States standing Feet away from feet away from Syria, ready to push the button. Everyone was talking about war. All targets were ready. England sent destroyers. The United States sent five of them, with many support ships. The military was ready. They were only waiting for the green light from Obama to start with the cruise missiles to destroy Syria. This was the picture we were looking at last time we talked. The United States was ready to go to war. England was ready to go to war. And then all of a sudden something happened. No war. Now, we said, the United States said that it drew red lines, that if chemical weapons are used, that the United States will go. As you know, John McCain was very much ready to, he's been ready to actually start a war with Syria. He was just itching to start a war with Syria. He was so sure that the war with Syria was going to go on that in the Senate hearing about Syria, he was playing poker on his phone. That's how confident he was that finally his wish was coming true. What happened? Why did it all stop? Well, we're going to tell you why did it all stop in a little bit. Continue watching. And you will be shocked with the information that you're going to receive tonight of why did the United States stop the war. Why, when it was only hours, 
It was only hours away from pushing the buttons to annihilate thousands or hundreds of thousands of people in Syria. This limited thing and very small thing that was, no, there's no such a thing as limited and small. Not with all the guns that we put on the coast of Syria. And not with the guns that England sent in and France was sending in. Then the whole thing stopped. What happened? You remember David Cameron, it was, you know, when they hit Libya, they didn't go to the British Parliament asking them that they're going to go to war against Libya. Obama, when he actually went into the war with Libya, he didn't ask Congress, he didn't go in front of Congress and said, hey, look, we're going to bomb the heck out of this country and we're going to destroy it. That's exactly what happened. Killed its leader. Killed Gaddafi, its leader. So the West went into these Arab countries and killed the leaders without congressional approval, without United Nations approval, without the British Parliament approval, and France without the French Parliament. But in France, it's a little bit different. The president does not need the blessings of his parliament to start a war. He just has to tell them, to tell the, uh, uh, his parliament within 90 days from start of the war of why he started the war. That's the French law. That's why France, when England said, I'm going to go to ask Parliament. Ask the Parliament why. You already sent in the destroyers. You already sent in the Thunderbirds. You already sent in the tornadoes. You already sent in the missiles. And you were ready to start bombing. So why after positioning all these ships of the coast of Syria, everything had to be done and it had to be done quickly? Now, the British Parliament was not in session. It was going to be another week or the following week before they actually be in session. Now, why couldn't he wait? Why Cameron, David Cameron, couldn't wait to actually, for the next week, to go in front of his parliament and asked him. No, he called for an emergency meeting. It had to be done tonight. Hurry up, we've got to do this tonight. Why? Well, you are going to war, so why go and ask the parliament? Maybe you did not ask those questions, but we did because we're watching everybody and we know when something is unusual and right away, when David Cameron said he's gonna go to the parliament, that was a big flag for me. And then when he called them that they had to come that night, then I knew it's a big, big flag. Something is wrong. And then when his own, when the members of his own party don't show up to the vote, that was another bigger flag. And then when member of his party that actually voted against the war, that was as that was the mother of all flags. What happened? Why did Cameron actually organize this thing to fail? He went to the British Parliament to fail. He wanted a vote of no. And right away, England said, okay, we're out. We can't do anything. And then Obama, all of a sudden, even though he was going to war, and even though he already put his ships ready, 
and his military commanders told him, we got the targets ready, we're just waiting on you to tell us to push the button. Right away, Obama was talking about going to Congress to get their approval. Well, why? You are going to war without their approval. And no one, by the way, if you go back to that day when Obama said, I need to get approval, no one was talking about, hey, Obama, why are you going to war by yourself? No one. Why are you not getting uh, congressional uh, approvals? No one was even asking for it. He wasn't being pressured to go to Congress to get their approval. But he had to. So what happened? Why did they have to run and get out of bombing Syria? That's the question. And that's the question that you have been listening to me here for the last 15 minutes wanting to know why. We're going to tell you why. But let's talk some more. Let's talk some more about what is actually happening in Syria. Well, in Syria you have three major groups. You have the regime of Bashar al-Assad. You have the Free Syrian Army, which is basically mainly Syrians, mainly Syrians, because they do have some foreigners uh, within them, but mainly Syrians, who very much took it upon themselves with the help of the Muslim Brotherhood internationally and in Egypt and in Jordan. They're getting help from the Muslim Brotherhood. They're getting help from Saudi Arabia. They're getting help from Qatar. But also you have another group in Syria called a Nusra Front. Now, these are new kind of Muslims. These are new breed of Muslims. By the way, I have been a Muslim all my life. And if you go to many of the Muslim countries, you will not see people looking like that, dressed up like that. And by the way, this is, if you go back to the other picture, this is this Anasra group actually killing prisoners. When in Islam, you see, you have got to differentiate, and this is another one killing uh, soldiers, uh, Syrian army soldiers, prisoners, that these people have taken, these, these uh, 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 cowards have taken alive with their hands behind their backs and they're blindfolded, they're shooting them. And these are supposedly Muslims. The group that is shooting, the group that is killing, this vicious killing, killing prisoners, cutting open their hearts and, and, and eating their hearts. They supposedly do it under Allahu Akbar. God is great. If you go back 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, if you went to Muslim countries, you did not see those images of Muslims. Now, the image of Muslims in your head, it's these long beard, screaming, uh, gun toting. That's the image of a Muslim in your head. But 99% of Muslims don't look like that. They don't dress like that. So who's, who's, who's bringing these people? Who's training them? Al-Qaeda? Al-Qaeda, the one that the United States actually helped establish and financed until the end and until now? 
You know, some of you are probably old enough to remember President Reagan. You know, Reagan and the Taliban, that's at the time when the United States was helping. They created them. And we do have a picture of Reagan sitting with the uh, Taliban uh, at the White House when he was president. So, this is what the, uh, the Taliban and the Muslims and this Al-Qaeda is all about. It's all an American creation controlled, financed, to be used for different things. You know, they already put the investments in these people when they were in Afghanistan fighting the Russians. And then they used them in Libya. They used them in Syria. They are using them in Syria. They're just in Yemen. It's the same groups. It's the same people. They made the Muslim image look like those screaming, long-bearded Muslims. When Islam has nothing to do with these people. Islam is not what you are seeing. You want to see how Afghanistan looked like in the 60s? See, this is the image of a Muslim. But look how Afghanistan looked like in the 60s. These girls are in Afghanistan. This is on the street of Kabul. These are Afghani women. Now, what happened to Afghanistan now? These are the Afghani women now. Right here. Is this Islam? No, it's not. This is not Islam. This is not Islam. You know, the image of a Muslim in your head is that screaming Muslim. People like that. Have you thought that, hey, Muslims don't look like that? And they don't, by the way. Have you, like, a Muslim doctor? Isn't this an image of a Muslim? That's how most Muslims look like. Just normal people, professionals, astronauts, engineers, doctors, all these are Muslims. But that's not the image in your head. The image of a Muslim in your head is the one that wants to kill Christian. Just like what this charade in Kenya was all about. Now remember when General Wesley Clark Remember when he said that after 9-11 he went to visit some of his buddies in the, uh, at the Pentagon and one of his generals told him, he said, we are going to take over seven countries, seven countries in five years. Well, it's taken much longer than five years, but they are taking over these countries. He said, starting with Iraq, okay? He said, starting with Iraq, then we're going to go to Libya. We're going to go to Syria. We're going to go to Lebanon. And we are going to finish it off or we are going to finish off Iran after that. Now, isn't that what happened? Now, when Wesley Clark said it, everybody thought, now nah, what is he doing? 
But that's the truth. And that's, by the way, what we have been saying from the beginning, that it's not going to stop at Iraq. Because Israel wants all these countries destroyed. We're not doing this for the United States. We're doing this for Israel from beginning to end. Now, this Al-Nusra group, it's a terrorist group. It's people the United States was fighting in Afghanistan called them Al-Qaeda, and then they used them, and they were supporting them, the United States was supporting these people in Libya to destroy Gaddafi. Now, what's going on in Libya now? Remember when, we were, when uh, uh, Anderson Cooper was almost crying on the air about Libya and about Egypt? What's going on in Libya now? War, death, destruction. What was going on before when Gaddafi was there? Stability. And many, at least people were going to school. They were not fighting in the streets as it is now. What about in Egypt? What about in Yemen? What's going on in Yemen? What about the Middle East, this democracy, exporting democracy? Well, we told you it's the biggest lie. Before they even went there, we told you they want to destroy. You cannot, democracy, it's not something that you pick up and say, here, democratize. Democracy, it's a system. It's a culture of democracy. You have to grow up. You have to have democracy. Not being exported. It's got to come from within you. It wasn't easy for the United States to actually establish this system. I mean, it's not a fabulous system, but it's better than others. You know, it's a system that can be bought with money. You can purchase power in the United States. Well, that's not a good system. But guess what? It's probably one of the best in the world. The system. But is it really working that good? It's not. But other systems in the world, they're not working at all. Our system is being bought and paid for by money. People who have money, people who control money, control the media, control politicians. Now, so what happened? Let's get back into Syria, and I'm sure you are consciously waiting to hear exactly what happened in Syria and why did we stop it? Why did we stop the war? Well, I appreciate your patience, but this is what happened. Russia tried to stop the war, to stop the United States from bombing Syria. And if you've been following this, Kerry, John Kerry, our Secretary of State, was on his high horse talking about war and bombing, and even they reminded him that, hey, look, you know, you were against the war when you were young, not because you are in power, you are for the war, and he was going after it. No one was convincing John Kerry that the war will not go, 
No one's going to convince him it was a go. It was a go with Obama. Until the truth about the chemical weapons without a doubt. And the Russians had proved this. And for those of you observers and followers, you remember Netanyahu flew to Moscow. And there was a lot of diplomatic activities going on around the world because Syria was going to be destroyed within hours. That night, the Russians said, if you bomb, we're going to prove to the world that it was the opposition in Syria that had used chemical weapons. It was not the regime that had used chemical weapons. And they proved to them, they proved to them that that was the fact. It was the opposition that actually used chemical weapons. It was not the, the regime as the United States was claiming and still claiming, by the way. But that's okay. Claiming is one thing and destroying a country is another thing. So why did England had to rush? Why did David Cameron had to rush to his parliament? Because they wanted a way out of bombing. They could not bomb because they had no moral leg to stand on if they bombed. Because they were bombing. They were bombing because the regime used chemical weapons. Well, Russia said, if you fire a bullet, we're going to prove to the world that it was not the regime that you are bombing. What are you going to do then? The only other alternative was to clean up the image of the United States and to restore that big mistake. They did not want to make the same mistake they made in Iraq when they bombed Iraq for weapons of mass destruction that they did not have. Well, is this going to be again where the United States is bombing a country, killing its president, destroying the country, destroying the infrastructure, destroying the defenses of that country that is only a few feet from the biggest enemy there, Israel, for using chemical weapons when they in fact did not use them. And Russia was going to show and prove, prove to the world that the regime did not do it. What was America going to do? Turn the gun on the opposition there, on the Free Syrian Army, that they are supporting, that they sent in there, they equipped, or on al-Nusra? Of course not, because that's going to basically screw up everything about Syria. Now, you know the United States is not going to go and bomb the opposition, because that's going to help the regime that the United States tried to unseat. So how did this thing happen? How could a big mistake like this happen? And why did the opposition use chemical weapons? Now, do they have the capability? Yeah, they do have the capability. Because the head of this, as we told you in, in last program, the head of the Syrian chemical weapons division had exited the regime and went to the other side. So the head of the regime, the regime's chemical weapons now belongs to the Free Syrian Army with a bunch of his people around him. So they knew how to make it. We have videos showing that they definitely know how to make it because they showed it. I mean, the stupidity is 
taking a picture of this video and putting it on YouTube. The Free Syrian Army had captured some weapons from the Syrian regime, like weapons depot. And they had that on video. Some of the captured weapons, it was mainly old stockpile of Russians' equipment. And some of these shells that they had shown on YouTube months before, months before, shells that the Syrian army does not even use anymore. The Free Syrian Army captured those and that's what they used to use with the chemical weapons. It was proven that the shells were old shells that the Syrian regime does not use anymore, but they were captured a few months before by the Free Syrian Army and those are the shells that were used to bomb these with chemical weapons. I'm not defending the regime, by the way. I was and I'm still against all the regimes in the Middle East. I'm not defending the regime. And that's a big, it, it, it's a big pain in my soul, actually. That many of my friends, and I tell them, look, I have to call it the way I see it. I'm not given an opinion as an analyst. As an analyst, you try to analyze the best you can with the information you have without being biased. Without being biased. And to really... I mean, I, I've received many emails on my uh, Facebook page that one time I'm against Morsi in Egypt and against the Muslim Brotherhood. Then when the coup took place, I was, it looked like that I was defending Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood when, when in fact I was not. I was defending the democracy that took place in Egypt, because Morsi was elected. He was elected with a good, solid, popular election. And uh, Carter Center uh, was there, many. The United Nations was there, the United States was there to observe the elections, and everybody said, it's perfect. So people, when they hear me talk, sometimes they think, oh, he's with... Bashar al-Assad. No, I'm not. I'm with nobody. I'm with nobody. I'm not on the side of anyone. Because if I side up with one side, then I'm not objective anymore. And I won't be able to give you a non or unbiased analysis. So, the United States was faced with we can't bomb because the price was going to be too high that the only thing we do if we started war and we started bombing we cannot stop that we have to bomb the free Syrian army because they're the ones who use chemical weapons and the United States was not about to do that. France was not about to do that. England was not about to do that because that's not in the best interest of Israel. They wanted them to bomb the regime. See, everybody was saying that, oh, well, you know, they did not want these groups, these uh, Mujahideen or whatever, uh, taking over chemical weapons and taking over Syria. No. These groups are controlled by handlers. These groups are controlled by Qatar and Saudi Arabia. And the United States is in total control of Qatar and Saudi Arabia. You know, when it was over for the prince of Qatar, they told him, 
Step down and take your cousin with you because we finished with you. You did what we needed you to do and now it's time to go. And he stepped down. He didn't step down because he really, you know, he was saying, oh, we need to have the younger generations. No. He stepped down because it was it. He came to, he came to the end of his use by the United States. And the United States, if they want this Al-Nusra front to stop, all they have to do is just cut the, uh, the supplies. All they have to do is tell Turkey that is trying desperately to become part of the European Union because that's where the biggest supplies come in from. You stop Turkey supplying these people on Nasra, you give it two weeks, they'll be out. You stop the uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar from supplying the Free Syrian Army, they'll be out. Well, but what happened though? Why did the opposition actually do that? Why did they use chemical weapons? Now, was chemical weapons used by them? They were coerced by the CIA to actually use it? Or did they use it as a uh, final or as the final card in their hand? Now, why do we say the final card in their hand? The Free Syrian Army is very much an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. The men that are fighting, they're supplied by the Muslim Brotherhood in, from many countries, from Egypt, from Jordan, wherever the Muslim Brotherhood, from Libya, from Tunisia, wherever the Muslim Brotherhood were, they sent men to fight against the regime. So what happened? Well, the regime was gaining in the last few months. The regime was gaining big time against the rebels. And then this group, Al-Nusra Front, that came from Afghanistan and Libya and Yemen and uh, Chechnya and, 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 thinking that they are fighting for God, thinking that they are protecting Islam. Brainwashed. They're not the only ones brainwashed, by the way, because we have a lot of brainwashed people right here in the United States. So brainwashing people it goes on all over the place. So these, these Al-Nusra front, these foreigners that they supposedly connected with Al-Qaeda, they are very much, they're brainwashed. They think that they are going to actually win this thing when they are, see, they don't know that they are 100% controlled by the CIA controlled by the United States, controlled by the Mossad. Now, a big war is going on between these groups, by the way, inside Syria. Al-Nusra and the Free Syrian Army, they are fighting. So the Free Syrian Army, after the fall of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which was the biggest supporter of them against the regime. But the Muslim Brotherhood were no more in Egypt. They went from controlling Egypt, controlling the policy of Egypt, into being in prison. The Muslim Brotherhood, a couple of days ago, was outlawed in Egypt. So they went from being at the helm 
on the top of this pyramid into being in prison. This was a big defeat for the Free Syrian Army because they're getting a lot of help from there. So, faced with the destruction of the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood movement in Egypt and the control of the Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan and other places and the regime gaining from one side, the al-Nusra gaining and fighting them from another side, it was a big defeat for the Free Syrian Army. They had one card to play. If the United States of America would enter the war, they're okay. If the United States does not enter the war, they're not okay. If the United States enters the war and comes in and destroys the regime like they did in Libya, then the Free Syrian Army is okay. But they're not going to be okay if they go on the way they were with al-Nusra beating up on them from one side. The regime is gaining big time in many, many places. The less support they are getting from around the world and from, around, from the Muslim Brotherhood, they had only one card to play. The United States. How do we get the United States into entering the war and getting rid of the regime? Chemical weapons. Now, were they coerced? Were they conned? Were they trapped? Was it a bad advice? Did they go, did they do this by themselves? That we don't know. All we know is the trap that was set up to catch the United States did not work. It backfired big time. This is the reason why the United States, England, France, they could not bomb. Now, the regime, the day when they had the bombing, the, uh, on August 21st, when the chemical attack actually took place and killed all these children. You know, in, in the pictures, You've seen a lot of children, but not a lot of, and a lot of women without their parents. Now, there are stories out there, and these, are, these stories are credible stories, and they are facts on the ground. There were many people who moved, they were moved, forcefully moved from their homes in one area into the area where the bombing took place. Many of the people who died, they were not from that same area, that same neighborhood. They were brought in from other places in Syria. Number two, the attack took place on the same day when UN inspectors actually were arriving in Damascus. Now, the regime welcomed the UN inspectors, just like poor Saddam did the same thing, and he thought, Okay, well, come see. I don't have any weapons of mass destruction. So he thought that was actually going to uh, save him, but did not. So Syria said, sure, send the inspectors. 
in the two or three times when the um, when chemical weapons was allegedly used, the inspectors who went and inspected those sites said it was not the regime that used it. It was, and this is United Nations inspector. She said not in this time, but the one before. She said that it was the opposition that used it, but it was on very small scale. But with this one, you know, the United Nations inspectors went in there after the attack, but they only confirmed that chemical weapons were used. They did not confirm, they were not even, their mandate was not go find out who actually fired the shots. That was not in their mandate. Their mandate is go see, number one, they were going in there to inspect chemical weapons and see if chemical weapons were used in other sites. Remember, there were many massacres before. So the, arm, the, the, the regime, with confidence, they said, bring them. And on the day they arrived, that's when the chemical weapons attack took place. Now, do you think, and not far from where the inspectors were, it's not like in a remote area in Syria. No, in Damascus itself. So, you think the regime is that stupid? Is that crazy? That will use chemical weapons? Knowing that these inspectors are coming? When things are still fresh? That's number one. Oh, actually that was number two. Number three, if the regime wants to use chemical weapons, he would at least use them to get a battlefield advantage. He will use them to kill soldiers from the other side. If the regime got so desperate, and the regime was not desperate in that area, that is Damascus. The regime is very strong in Damascus. Very strong. So it was not like a desperate moment for the regime that they had to use chemical weapons. No. So why did... Well, actually, to finish that thought... Those who died, they were babies and their mothers and men sleeping at 2 o'clock in the morning. They were not fighters. So there's no strategic advantage. You know, many of these pictures, you've seen many, many children, but no parents. And by the way, in many, you've got to be very careful when you see pictures, when you see um, uh, when you see videos, be very careful. Don't 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 just take what you're seeing at face value. You know, like I say, believe one tenth of what you hear and half of what you see. Don't just see all poor things because in a video that was supposedly shot on August 21st when these people were dead, in one of the videos, the guy gets up and starts laughing. But were all the videos like that? Of course not. So just be very careful when uh, you, you're watching uh, videos and you're seeing videos. And did you really see videos for 1,400 dead that day? Because all of the estimates, the real estimates from that day is about 380 to 400. 
It was not 1,300 or 1,400 as they were claiming. But it doesn't matter, even if it's 50. It doesn't matter. But now you do understand why the regime could not have fired those. Because the regime has better bombs, better shells. Those were old Russian shells that they had got back in the 70s that they're not using them. But they're stockpiling them somewhere in a, uh, a depot that the Syrian army, the, 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 the Free Syrian army actually captured and used. So the West was under no position to strike at Syria. So how do we stop the war? How do we go back and say, okay, we're not bombing, but we can't tell you why we're not bombing. Because everybody was saying that, oh, well, you know, uh, they were scared of like the Russians actually getting into the war. No. Russia would not get into, the war, into war with the United States. Bombing and bullets and missiles, they're not going to do that. And when the United States was going to bomb Syria, Russia did not say, if you bomb them, hey, look, we're going to bomb. No. Russia and the United States will not go to war over Syria. No. Because both will lose a lot. And everybody was saying, oh, because Syria actually threatened that they were going to bomb Israel. No. Israel wants to bomb the heck out of Syria. Israel has nuclear weapons. Israel has nuclear weapons. So if Syria throws some missiles with chemical weapons, killing 10, 15,000, 20,000 Israelis, okay? I mean, that's a lot. But let's say they did it. Chemical weapons will not destroy a country. It will kill a lot of people. But within hours, it's going to be gone. Israel, on the other hand, had nuclear bombs. And if Syria used chemical weapons, they were going to use those, those nuclear bombs. And it will take out Damascus completely. I mean, it's not like it wasn't used before. I mean, the United States had used nuclear bombs in, 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 uh, in Japan. In Hiroshima and Nagasaki back in 1945, I believe. So they've used them. And if the Israelis get bombed with chemical weapons, they're going to use nuclear so that wasn't it. And the Syrians knew it. And the Syrians were actually bracing and they were moving all these armies and moving everything out of their military installations into the neighborhoods, getting ready to be bombed. They were ready to be bombed. And at the last moment, when the Russians said, look, we got the proof. And Obama started talking about going to Congress. And Netanyahu was flipping out of his mind. So he flew. Even his country, you know, they were distributing these gas masks because, hey, look, tonight was going to be the night. I mean, why would Netanyahu, knowing that tonight was going to be the night, that he would fly? Well, because he got the message from Obama we're not bombing. We got a problem. You know, Houston, we got a problem. So he flew right away to Moscow, Netanyahu, met with Putin, showed him the proof that it was not the regime that did it. That it was the oppositions that did it. And this is the proof. So Netanyahu goes back, and now they're back to the drawing board. Now do you understand why the war had to be stopped? It's not because of Congress or the British Parliament, no. 
because we had no choice but to kill the oppositions, bomb the opposition there to help the regime. We weren't going to do that. So they said, okay, how do we get out of this? So they started talking about, okay, we need something big. We need something big for the United States to actually accept. And that something big is Syria turning your chemical weapons. Now, Syria is going to turn in some, probably bleach and, you know, uh, whatever. But, and we're talking about like the mid of 2014, when they have to actually get, 2014, that's like, that's like another year. That's like another year. So, anyway, that's all we have for you. And all we have to say is good night. We'll see you a month from now. That's it? Just stop it.